start by just going back um, really to where this all began in 1906, 1907 of the construction um, of, um, of the bathhouse. Um, this was the first tourism investment um, in the country by the government at the time and really was trying to attract tourists after the destruction of the um, pink and white terraces in 1886. Um, this is probably a bit of a giveaway really um, in terms of um, why the museum's closed. And I'll probably draw your attention to the bottom um, um, right hand picture. Sorry, left. Um, um, which really um, shows some of the real core cool issues that we have. So this was construction 1906 style. The, um, these are the columns um, placed on the ground. Um, they're not in the ground, they're placed on the ground, foundations, and, and really what's missing from here um, is any sign of steel. So there um, are just basically pumice concrete piles um, and the rest of the buildings constructed on, on top of those. Um, that was the material they had at the stage um, and um, according to um, the, the um, specifications of the building that um, 12 gauge barbed wire of a reputable brand was to be installed into the walls and the floors and columns and of course um, We've x-rayed those um, walls and columns, and yes, there is some, but they're not everywhere the way they should have been. So I guess at that period, there were no building inspectors to verify that. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um, and then I'll just race you forward to the 14th of November, um, 2016, a little after midnight, when the Kaikoura earthquake struck. Now that actually triggered a local event. It wasn't the Kaikoura earthquake itself that created the damage here, it was a local event. Um, the trigger, probably from the Kaikoura earthquake. Um, and um, that really um, was the, the, really the beginning of um, the issues we're faced with today. So after that, what we discovered the next morning, there was a series of additional cracks. The building um, had cracks in it, and, and they were uh, been recorded since um, one year after um, the building was opened, and, and subsequently um, cracks have appeared throughout the building throughout the years. Um, but this added just under the floor an additional 142 cracks from that, uh, that one quake. And you can see here there are various and different places within the building. They're in the walls, columns, and, um, um, and in the floor here. And some of them ranging up to a centimetre wide. The project. So where are we at in the, in the phase of this project? So we're currently um, sitting in almost the end of what we call developed design stage. Um, this is a stage um, that will close in the next uh, couple of weeks um, and that re then takes us into detailed design or, or basically we move into um, the shop drawings that con con contractors need to, to do the work that we're asking them to do. Um, we start off with a, what they call a DSA, detailed sizing assessment, so we need to understand what the strength of the building was. Um, what was it? What what what, um, what was it capable of holding in terms of any um, seismic activity, in terms of its seismic strength? Concept design is really a high-level design of what the building and um, what we could do with the building. 
and then develop designers in more detail. It's a complex project. It's, it's not easy. Um, I mean, the first thing is that this is a Category 1 heritage building, and that requires to have conservation plans and heritage protection plans. And that's before some of our funding applications can be completed, or um, we can apply resource consent, we need to complete those things. Um, we have a weak structure. Um, um, yeah, as I said before, it's pumice concrete. Um, we have um, corroded connections, so within the building, the bolts, in fact, most of the nails are completely corroded away through hydrogen sulfide. They're not, they're just gone. Um, poor ground conditions. The ground conditions under the museum um, um, aren't the best. And in fact, in 2010, um, while they were um, constructing the uh, South Wing extension, the Centennial Project, um, we discovered some cabins under the, under the um, ground there and injected 140 tonnes of ground and injection into the ground to support the building. Um, meeting today's compliance standards is, um, is a challenge as well in a heritage building. So you've got conflicts between heritage fabric um, retention and preservation, and then meeting today's modern fire standards, accessibility standards, etc. Um, the building conditions, um, it's, you know, it's 111 years old, um, it's it leaked since day one, um, and we've got some of those issues to address at the same time in terms of you know, those corrosion elements as well. Um, a lot of the bolts that hold the, the museum's um, frame walls to those pumice concrete um, walls have completely disintegrated and gone. Most of them are 30 percent best. Um, the absence of as-built information. So over the year, people have made changes to that um, to the building, but um, that hasn't all been recorded. So we've had to go back and and work through um, what's there, what's not there. Um, we're uncovering walls, etc. And the structure at the moment is three individual buildings. So you have the, the main heritage building um, in the centre. You have the North, uh, North Wing extension in 2008 and the 2011 South Wing extension. And they all have various different degrees of strength. And that doesn't work when we're trying to um, strengthen the whole building. So we're trying to, what we'll, we'll do is we'll make those one building instead of three separate functions. And of course, the challenge of raising significant funding um, over this period, and only just recently, you know, in the last couple of weeks, where the Prime Minister announced the, the final parcel of 20 million for us. Um, you know, we're almost three years down the track, it's taken that long. Um, funding, so this is where we are um, as of today. So, um, you know, we've raised 51 million, 15 million from Rotorix Council, commitment in the long term plan. The Provincial Growth Fund, 15 million. Um, Rotorua Energy Charity Trust, Local Trust, 10 million. Um, the Lotteries Grant, which was a significant projects um, grant. Uh, Regional Heritage Fund from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. And then the um, $100,000 from the Philip Very um, Foundation. So that was, um, uh, was a really nice touch from that family. Um, the project objectives, so it's not just about fixing parts of the building, we really had to come up with some objectives of what we were trying to achieve. Um, we want to build the, um, bring the building up to 80% um, NBS, so NBS stands for New Building Standard. Um, the building is currently rated at 19%. Um, for, an earth, for, for, for a building to be um, um, not earthquake risk or earthquake prone, it needs to be above 67 so, um, um, you know, like I said, 19, anything below 33 is earthquake prone, which is what um, our building is. Um, we extend the coverage of the um, climate control and scrub air system to, um, to around um, 90%. Currently, it's only at 50%. And we know from history, by not doing that, we're increasing the corrosion rates within the areas that we're not covering. Um, accessibility, um, so moving that from um, from around 60% up to 90%, and I'll show you a little bit how we're going to achieve that in the plans. Um, and then um, regulatory requirements, um, the toilet facilities, and you all know that um, the, um, the main toilets on the, on the, um, the main floor, you know, having um, a couple of pans just doesn't work for, for any of us, really. Um, and then protecting those heritage features, so ensure that we, um, you know, that we um, are respectful of the heritage fabric and, and really protect that and ensure and restore it um, while we're doing this project. 
and we've uncovered, uncovered some real gems in that um, process so far. Um, you know, we're obviously looking for the revenue um, advantages as well when we reopen. So we're looking at the cafe, the retail area, um, etc. Um, and then the decision by council was really to do this all at once, and really I don't think we could do it any other way with a building at 90%. Um, detailed seismic assessment was the first thing that we had to do. Um, so we needed to understand the structural performance of the building, um, evasive sampling, um, building condition, you know, the connections I've already mentioned, the timbers, um, and then the ground performance, how that ground is actually going to act in a seismic event. So the first thing we did was geotech um, testing. Um, and so we took some um, core samples of the land around uh, the museum and, and again on an angle back under the building. We can't actually get under the building to take samples directly under. And the slide on the, on the left here um, is really the, it shows you the condition of the ground. So the left hand side, and that's it's upside down actually, but that's around about six metres. At six metres you can get up to 40 degrees in temperature. Um, and you'll see it's, it's basically clay mud. Um, and then we move into some of the sediments. So that's the old lake bed sediments that were there when the lake level was a lot higher. And then further we've got, you'll see a little bit more of the, um, the pumice. So that's the ground we're trying to um, build on. So it's a, it's a challenge, um, but um, it's, uh, it's doable. But the good thing about the, this testing, retesting, was the grouting injection we injected in 2011 is still there, still doing its job. Ways of testing. Um, so we've taken core samples from the floors, the walls, various different places to ascertain um, its strength and you know, looking for that golden piece of um, chicken wire. Um, but, um, and, and a letter from the engineers in, in Wellington at the time in 1996, they suggested putting some railway mines in and we actually found those. So they're in the, in the basement, the mud bath basement, but they're laying horizontally so they're not doing much for it structurally really. Um, we've got some samples of the core samples um, and this gives you an indication of um, um, what the building is actually made of. You'll see the um, a sample where sulfur's played a bit of a role in terms of deterioration. Um, but to give you an idea, th these samples um, in terms of strength are about 3.8 to 9 um, MPA, which is how we measure the strength of concrete. It's 10% of what it should be. So um, you can see the, the, the challenge we have around that. Most construction for commercial buildings should be around 40, 40 MPA. So we're at 3.8 to 9. Um, these are the other parts of the building that we've opened up, and I've got hundreds of these shots. Um, I really wanted to show you, that, um, the, particularly the one on the bottom right here, which is where um, we uncovered the original tiles um, in the um, Rachel Paul area, which is actually now the cafe. And um, we plan to bring those back to life and, um, and, and bring, uh, reopen those up. Um, the, the geotech and this testing, geotech took us um, three months to get a, a drill on site. It took us further six months by the time we had the results back and the peer review. Um, so that's the time frame that passes by. There's so much demand on these services, we just have to wait in the queue. And the same with the testing with the um, concrete, um, just takes time. So what all that um, showed us was that at the end of the um, day when the testing came back, the heritage part in the middle here um, came at 19%. The 2011 build came at 74%. Um, and some people are going, well, if it built in 2074, why is it 74%? Sorry, uh, 2011. Um, it's simply because the building standards have improved. This was um, constructed and designed pre-Christchurch. And so the standards have changed. And um, the, the real issue with the, the South Wind expression at 74 is simply the connections, how it's, the, the steel is connected to the, the floor plates. Um, they're considered brittle connections, and in Christchurch they failed. So while we're doing this work, we're taking the opportunity to upgrade those. It's not a significant piece of work, and that will bring that into the building back up to close to 100%. The next, um, um, the orange um, bit and the 2008 um, um, build, um, the reason it's 2008 is simply because it's connected to the heritage wall. It doesn't, it's not independent. The southern wind extension has a seismic break, so it's a separate structure. But because of that 2008 building weight's connected to the heritage, it's, it's considered part of the building. 
Well, when you rate a building, you rate at um, the lowest denomination with humans is the de detail saving system rating. Okay, actually, I will just go back um, here because I do want to just point out we were really surprised by this piece here being rated at 19% um, because you know it did have some work done to it in the 2011 extension. Um, that coming in at 19% really triggered um, the fact that we then had to make a decision to de-install um, all the time and objects out of that South Wing Gallery. And um, so this is the start of this process. Now this is not an easy process. It's not like when you pack up at home. Each and every object has its um, a case made, it's fit for purpose, it's designed for that particular object. Each, each um, item is cleaned and a condition, what we call a condition report is done on every object. Now we um, had to talk to um, various lenders, so we were and um, worked closely with Tapapa, we worked closely with Auckland Museum and, and conservators um, Declan Klein. Um, we have to provide detailed plans on how we're going to move this to our insurers. So it's quite a complex process just to move that. Six months in the planning, basically for two, two weeks worth of work to, um, to move these out, the large ones anyway. Um, and the same um, with the summer sculptures. We had to reinforce the floor and, and agro crop underneath the floor to remove these. Um, Eve, you know, the, the heaviest sculpture is pretty close to two ton on, a, on her own. Um, once again, um, detailed process and, and removing those. And the first time those summer sculptures have been out of the um, museum um, for 110 years when we moved out last year. So um, it's quite a sad day that day. Um, and then we've got cultural considerations. So there's a blessing of the Tonga when, when, when it came, came out. Lots of consultation um, with, um, with Te Arawa. Um, and this was a day um, that we had to move out and the, the last truck, um, Pukaki came out. So it was quite um, emotional and Pukaki is here at our offsite store. Some of the objects, we just didn't have space here, so they um, went back to their lenders, which was all from Museum and Te Papa. Special air ride trucks for those. So um, yeah, quite a bit of work in planning. And without one incident, the museum team did a fantastic job. Um, the other part of the, the, um, the project was we needed to understand, um, remeasure the building. You know, and in, in, in a few years ago, we would have had a team over there with the tape measures um, measuring. Now we use lasers called a three, 3D um, um, point cloud. So the whole building is scanned, and this is really a picture from all that, from those scans. It's millions and millions of dots. So you take the, build, take the laser wherever you want to go, go inside the building, it fires around and it takes everything. It's really critical for our project. This is um, the laser scan of the, um, of the foyer up on the mezzanine floor. You can even see it picks up the plants and it, you can even see it even picks up the objects in the, on the retail shelves down there. So this has been um, really critical for us in terms of progressing our, our models. Structural solution. Um, so this is um, the steel structural solution for the, for the whole building. So the south wing here at the top right, got some connections uh, to do with some bracing elements. Um, as, as you would expect, the main atrium is the most complex and, and the tricky for us to, um, to deal with. Um, and then this, the north wing, and I've got some other shots of this, probably just give you a little bit more indication of what um, the main atrium is. So the big, tall, blue um, steel, they're what we call strong max, they're 10.5 metres high. We'll have to take the roof off, and then we have to lower those down. We're going to chase the walls, so the walls are about 450 feet, we'll cut a groove in those, drop the steel down through those grooves all the way down to new foundations in the basement, in the basement and then we'll plaster over the top of them so you won't see them They'll disappear. Um, that is quite a feat um, in itself. And then um, here we have um, the floor, some of the floors and bracing coming back in. So all the bracing you see in the mezzanine floor area, we have to lift the entire floor We've got to cut grooves in each one of the, um, the beams because we need this, the steel to sit. Um, it can't be any higher than the current floor level, otherwise we affect the heritage doorways and all those sorts of things. That gets in, um, inserted and then we'll put the original floor back. So um, you can see it's, um, it's, it is quite complex. This is the, the steel just for the north wing. 
So you can see once again, um, the, the, the blue um, lines are, are the, the strong banks, and they're what we call the shear walls. There's four sets of shear walls, the main walls that support the structure. Um, a new foundation going around and completely underneath the building. There's most likely a lot of that we will actually need to dig out by hand because we can't access equipment under there. It's a fairly shallow foundation, it's only 1200 deep because if you remember those soil samples from before, if we go down too deep, um, we're going to have nothing to rest, um, rest the building on. Um, this is a view from underneath, um, the, actually from the mud bath basement. Uh, no, it's not. It's the other way around. No, no, I'm right. And we're looking from the ground level, uh, from um, underneath the building, looking back through the building um, towards the front, um, front doors. And um, this is the steel coming down. It's got to come down through the floors um, to underneath the building. So you can see um, the scale of work that needs to happen here. Now a lot of this will need to be um, um, brought in by hand. A lot of the steel is fairly, it's manageable by hand, but it is a, it's a piece by piece um, process. The other thing that we discovered in this process with the, the 3D scan is the building's not square, so there's probably no surprise there. It's actually 350 mils longer on one side than the other. Um, and, the, and, the, and the walls aren't straight either. So some of them move in and, over and lean in and out. So um, when you try to put laser cut steel into a bent building, it's going to be very much a bespoke process. Um, zone by zone, layer by layer. So I mentioned that um, the 3D scan. So what we do when we have our design meetings is we, we, we start at the ground level at one end. There's eight zones that we've got for the, the, for the building. And we're literally slicing the building up piece by piece. So when we're talking about a particular issue, then we, um, um, we can go into that and we can spin it around and look at it from different ways and all sorts. Um, we're at a point now where we've got, we've got our, um, our steel structure into that model. We've got a lot of the mechanical services into that model and we've got the, archi uh, the architecture into that model. And what happens when you get all that together is you get conflicts. So it means that um, you know, the architect might have an opening here but the, the structural engineer's got a beam right the way through it. So we go space by space, room by room, and we, we, we resolve all those um, conflicts. Um, I think we've got a couple left now, if that's all. But uh, you, can, you can see that why well, it's taking so long. Um, H2S, as I said before, has played a critical role in the, um, in the corrosion uh, of the building. Um, so we have, um, this time we're going to deal with those issues properly. Um, we've learnt a lot from, um, from the past, and so it's important we don't replicate um, those, um, those things that haven't really worked for us uh, in 2011. So all the electrical boards, all the controllers that control our high bat system will all be in scrubbed air rooms. So um, there's a little point in, you know, if you've got a fancy scrubbed air that's taking all the sulphur out, putting your controllers in the basement and not scrubbing them. They corrode and then when they start to fog, you can't keep clean air. Um, we're, um, more of the building, as I said before, is going to be air, con um, air conditioned and scrubbed air. So we're pressurising more of the building this time, so keeping that sulphur out. And how we do that, it's a bit like putting a vacuum cleaner on reverse. You know, if you put the, the pipe on the other end, get a cardboard box and cut a hole, put the vacuum cleaner in there, blowing air in, and it keeps, blows all the air out. It's the same principle we're trying to achieve with the building, just on a, a slightly bigger scale. Um, Purpose-built building to house the chillers. So after five years, the, you know, half a million volts of work of kit um, at the back of the building started to corrode. Um, and um, you know, year six, um, it all needs to be replaced. So we're addressing that this time by building a purpose-built building, keeping those chillers dry, um, and, and scrubbing the air that goes in there. And that will make a significant difference to our reliability of our air conditioning <coughs> system with scrubbed air, because without scrubbed air, um, we can't hold on many objects. And it's part of our agreements with many of our lenders about um, temperature control, humidity control, and hydrogen sulfide control. Um, underfloors, um, um, most of the, well, as I explained before, with lots of cracks throughout the building, so hydrogen sulphide was really pouring up through the floors, through the, um, the holes in the floor. So we'll be shock creating the whole floor as part of the um, structural solution for strengthening the floor and the columns. Um, it's around just for the floor only, not the foundations, it's 200 truckloads of shock creek to go under the building. Now, and that's all going to be hand plastered on to tidy it up so we preserve the look. 
Um, special attention to any floor penetration. So, you know, we've got pipes coming up. We've got to ensure that we seal those. So we, we um, stop um, uh, any hydrogen sulfide moving up through the building. And then we're going to create negative pressure in the, in the basement, which we haven't done before. So this is really um, so we ensure we're drawing um, air outside air in this time. And then we've got positive air pressure coming from the top down. So this hopefully, and I mean, no one's done this before, and we are the only museum in the world that scrubs for safe hydrogen sulfide. Um, this should make a huge difference to the air quality in the building and long-term maintenance um, um, costs for us. Um, this time the whole building will be ge geothermally heated, so we've got capacity there to do that, um, and we'll be taking that opportunity as well, and that will cut down particularly on the heating costs in the, in the winter months. Right, um, where are the changes, the main changes, um, in terms of what you'll see inside Ex externally? Success looks like for us as if nothing had happened, and the building will look just like it is today. Um, it'll, you know, it'll have a new roof um, and, and, and places, um, but fundamentally, she'll look just as beautiful as she always has. Um, main internal um, changes here, are, uh, um, part of it is compliance. So um, you will see up here where Rotorua Stories is, um, is um, that we need to be compliant um, and have those additional um, bathrooms, accessibility toilets, parent rooms, so we, we have to have those in. Um, you'll notice um, here in the... Uh, um, just, just here actually, uh, where one of the um, accessible toilets is, um, is where the lift was that took you up into the classroom, you know, where you had a 50-50 chance of getting to the top <laughs> at best. Um, so what we've done to address that, we've reversed this round. And so on this other side here, you'll see here we have a new room. So these are the heritage doors through here. You'll walk through here into a lobby, um, and there's a lift there that takes you up to the mezzanine floor. So this is a full-size lift, um, and that provides an opportunity for the museum to be able to bring objects and make the mezzanine floor an exhibition space, which really wasn't before, just wasn't possible. So that's quite exciting. Um, you'll see the set of steps there as well, and those steps will take you down into the mud bath basement. So because of the, the shop creek that's got to go under the building, we've got to lower everything down. Access through the north wing won't be possible anymore unless you want to crawl. So um, um, this sort of um, opportunity came out of the, the fact that we actually couldn't fit um, a lift and the disability um, access toilets on the other side, and so we had this option to move it over. Um, that's really, um, that's really, um, we've re really, well, you'll see the next slide anyway. Um, that will actually make quite a bit of difference for us. We're just replicating this on the other side here. We've got some additional storage for the museum because they always, always want storage. Um, and then the, the cafe on the, on the other side. Now what we've had to do with the cafe, we've got this mezzanine floor here, is that we've now got a second fire egress um, coming off the viewing platform area that comes down through um, the, the um, back wall of the, the um, current um, cafe, the wall there. So I'll show you that a little bit later. It gets a bit confusing. Um, so upstairs, as I mentioned before, this is the new, the new lift coming up, new foyer to come out. So basically doors directly opposite the classroom, those that are familiar with it. Um, and then we've taken out all these offices here. These offices got put in. They're not part of the original heritage build. So we're taking those out and we're bringing back the original heritage space here. That um, ends up being a conference space, be a space for talks like these. Um, or if you wanted to have a function in there, you could do that as well. Um, it'll be fully wired and with data and all, all the rest of it. Just some um, shots down here. Um, so this is the uh, ground floor, main atrium, heritage stairs. Uh, you'll walk in, um, um, these doors are actually permanently open. Um, so you can walk in here, walk into here, hop on the lift, go up to the mezzanine floor if you wish, or go down, or you can take the stairs down to um, the mud bath basement. Um, we're looking at doing this in gla glazing, so we can demonstrate, show people what the structure is, what the earthquake strength is, so it's really telling that story. Um, you know, the next part of this building's life. Down in the mud bath basement, you, once again, you'll arrive um, either by stairs or by the lift. Um, here, once again, we'll have a glazed area highlighting the, um, the steel structures. Um, we think about maybe painting some of the, the steel structures different colours because they are slightly um, different in terms of what they do, and we can interpret that into an exhibition. 
you'll walk through a corridor, um, glad of glaze once again, and you'll get a much closer look at the, um, the, the, the structure that was built underneath the main atrium in the centre here, which was originally for a fountain that was um, to be part of the um, um, opening, but um, they ran out of money and it never, never got finished. Um, and then round into the bath, bath basement, and some of that will look pretty familiar to you. I mean, it's, it's a graphic drawing. Um, and that's how we're going to access the bath basement. So in that earlier information we distributed, you notice we had that glass link around the back, so we removed that. And there is a bit of saving for us by doing it this way. But much better, better accessibility, and, and but, um, much better connection with the building in the basement. Um, this is the um, cafe. So in 1908, the cafe, which was the, the Rachel Pool, um, looked like that. Um, just a few weeks ago, um, it looks like that. Um, so we cut a hole in the floor and the bath is um, still there. And then in, um, in 2022, um, it's going to look something similar to that. So I, I will make a point that this does look a bit modern looking, um, but it, it's not meant to. It's really meant to reflect the original heritage. And of course, those tiles that I showed you earlier, those are these tiles here. Some of those are getting remade and we'll put those back. We're glazing over the bottom of the, um, over the top, sorry, of the Rachel pool that's still there. So we're gonna use that as a feature to really demonstrate what the space was about. And a large graphic potentially on the back wall that you know, comes from the photo above. So really you understand what that space is rather than what it looks like today. Um, once again, here we have um, the, um, the corridor from the um, North Galleries. This is what it looked like when it opened in 1908. All right. um, this is what it looks like today. So you can see that um, the heritage um, um, features of that um, corridor is, is really, um, well, really, we, we've wrecked them, really, to be honest. Um, but in 2022, um, this is potentially what, um, what that corridor will look like. So um, we're uncovering, we're, we're, we're taking the roof out. Those skylights are still there. So it's all still up there. Um, so the, while once again, it does look a little bit modern, it, um, it will be the original heritage stuff up there or, or if we have to restore or replace them, we will. The corridor the same, is the same um, corridor, the same windows. We are glazing the cafe. Um, that's part of um, A, managing the environment. So, you know, a lot of people walking in and out, the cafe doors are open in the summer. We can't manage it with a, the with a Hybex system. So um, this will, um, um, will keep the, the noise out and keep the smells out as well. But once again, we're re-exposing the steel in certain places just to, to show people that it's there. And that was some of the feedback we had from um, Christchurch, um, was that people, once they um, see the steel, they're more comfortable and feel safer that it's been done. All right, so what's next? Um, we're currently removing asbestos from the building as we speak, um, and we're still in that process. It's a slow process. You, you take out what you do. We've had to take it out of the ground. So um, in two, I think when they did the, mud, uh, the, the um, exhibition under the building, um, they obviously raked it to make it look good, but what they didn't realize was that the lagging that fallen off the pipes all got mixed in with the dirt. So we've had to remove some of that from under the building. Um, we do have um, what they call Class A, um, which is in the lag piping um, of some of the old pipes, but we're addressing that right now. Um, the next two weeks, um, deconstruction work. So part of our um, plan is de deconstruct, and that's really to take out all the non-heritage stuff, cafe, kitchen, some of those non-heritage walls. Um, and in fact, they started on that today, so we're we ahead of the schedule. Um, we've, we've got to remove the shaping feet, the seat theater. Um, anything that really is not, not um, non-heritage. And we're also de-risking by uncovering things that we don't know about because the scan can't see through, through walls. We're actually re-exposing and potentially any, um, any challenges that we might um, have. We're tending for a contractor at the end of this month. Um, we already have five in terms of expression of interest, which we did a year ago. Um, and we'll have them on board quite, quite um, possibly by the end of the year. The stage one construction package, which is a southern wing and the shop creating of the floor, um, that will happen in, um, in February. Our deconstruction will take us that long anyway. Um, we're going to recruit a new director and we'll be going to the market any day now uh, for that role. Um, and then we need to fundraise uh, for the exhibition. The money we have so far is for the building restoration, but the, um, 
fundraising for exhibitions um, is the next piece of um, fundraising that we need to do so we can get a developer on board. Keeping up to date. If you want to keep up to date with the project, we are releasing information out on the project um, web page every week. Um, so you can um, go there. You can either get there through uh, rotorymuseum.co.nz or you can go to um, vision2action.nz at the council's website. Um, and there's videos on there. Um, there's lots of information on there right now. Um, not all the projects within council are quite on the, the vision to um, action yet, but they will be soon. Um, these are our partners, and I think it's important to point, point out um, the locals involved here. So, um, Carly <coughs> Architects, um, R, um, Burton's Construction, doing all our deconstruction work. We've worked with Burton's for years in the museum. Um, and then um, local um, Opus are our project managers. Um, BPA, um, our, um, our heritage architects, um, Dave Pearson, he did the original um, work when um, Tudor Towers came out and restored the foyer area. So he's really familiar with the building and it's great to have his knowledge on board. Um, and then GDT consultants, Mike Osborne there, um, he's from uh, the structural engineer, he's from Europe. And um, he has a huge amount of knowledge of heritage buildings, you know, hundreds of years old. And so he's um, really interested in it. So we've got the right people around, around the table. Um, and Ian Bowman um, is a peer review for our um, heritage architect. He, he, um, he's extremely well known in New Zealand and been around for many, many years. Um, I will um, time for some questions. So um, if you don't mind, I need to repeat my questions back to you so those people that are hearing me live streaming can know what those questions are, otherwise I won't hear them. Oh, the mic. Oh, we've got a mic. OK. Um, and just before the questions, we, we will have some more of these talks and updates. There's also Council's other projects as well, in terms of those big move projects. These are the dates and times, and those are the websites you can keep up to date. So I'd love to take some questions. Yes, the term Shot Creek, Creek, what exactly does that mean? Right, so basically it's a, a concrete that you actually pump in under the building. So, um, and you spray, it's a spray basically, so you spray it on in layers. So we need to spray 100 mil thick underneath the entire floor of the museum. So all the, all the services are currently attached to the floor will need to come down. We'll um, shock, they'll shock creep the whole building, and then we put that back. That strengthens the floor. Yes. capacity in the, in, the, in the Hybex system. Um, we've got, like in the uh, southern wing, for instance, that new lobby space where you go to the lift, we've got those heritage doors that will remain open, but we've got a set of um, automatic glass doors further in that will manage that for us. I mean, we're not going to mitigate hydrogen sulfide completely because it comes in on your clothes. On a wet day, um, when like, air pressure is lower, the hydrogen levels are higher, we're not going to stop at all but we, we will be able to um, maintain a, a much better environment than we have in the past. Yeah. All those going to be in here, Stuart? Are all those presentations going to be here? Yes, they're all here, yeah. Yes? I just want to say thank you. I mean, this is an incredibly difficult project, and we in the community haven't really known what's, what's been involved. And we've all been, some of us have been a bit critical and said, come on, let's open the museum. And had no idea uh, how difficult this is and how much expertise you've got on board and how much it's going to cost. It's just wonderful what you're doing. And I, every guest, I can't be more than the loss of this museum for the last three years because every one of my guests that I have in Rotorua, I take to the museum. It's just such a wonderful um, asset to have a Rotorua. So it's really lovely that you've updated us and thank you very much. No, 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 thank you for that, it's, um, it's very kind. And um, 
the, some of the challenges with this project, if we'd come out and said to you a year ago, this is what we're going to do, I'll be up here today saying, this is now what we're going to do, because it all would have changed in terms of what we learn along, learn along the way. So um, it, it, is a, it is a challenge. There is a couple of questions I know, because I saw them on Facebook a little bit earlier. One was about um, insurance. So um, you would have noticed in, the, in, the, um, in those first, that first couple of slides here, all the cracks under the building. Right. Insurance will pay for repairing those cracks. Repairing those cracks does not fix the issue with the building. The issue with the building is the way it was made in 1908. Mm -hmm. So um, in insurance in terms of that part, we have a $5 million access. It's probably unlikely, even with business interruption, that we'll get to that threshold. So you know, so if, you, um, you know, if you're at home and um, you, know, you break um, something, they come and fix that something, they don't fix the whole thing. So um, that's, that's why insurance, we won't get much insurance if, if any. That was one question. The other one was about Rotorua stories. So that was a question, of, uh, are we getting the shaking seeking seats back? Um, I don't have space for them um, to meet the clients, but we will have something else. Uh, we're not sure what that is yet, um, but I will tell you Rotorua stories to keep that going in the hydrogen sulfide environment was $200,000 in the last two years. It's really unaffordable. Um, it's old in its side, it's old technology. So, look, um, I guess watch this space, um, because we're not quite sure what that's, what new technologies look like. Everyone walks around with these 3D goggle things and things like that um, at the moment. Um, who knows, technology's moving so quickly. But I'm sure we'll find something that's exciting and thrilling. Yes? A question about the tiling of the roof, which is clay tiles at the moment? Yes, that's right. So the, the clay tiles are there, and, and I think um, for those people that were, um, particularly the friends of the museum, while I was giving talks uh, two years ago now, Joe, um, was that um, we were going to look at a lightweight tile option, a composite tile. Um, the first assumption was that you know when, the, when it was um, wet, um, those tiles weighed about 400 ton. It was sitting up on the roof, and you think about 400 ton on those walls and frames that I've just spoken about in this track. It's amazing how it all managed to stay up there for so long, but it, but it, but it has. Um, so we looked at a lightweight stru a structure, a uh, lightweight tile rather, and the, our gain from that was less steel in the building and smaller gauge. Um, with that particular um, tile, we've had um, samples made, um, but the, the challenge we have is that um, for that product to be approved in New Zealand, it has to go through a brands test, um, and those tests won't be completed until April next year. Um, that would mean that we would have to, we'd be sitting there with a potentially a lightweight design that may or may not get approved. So that would delay us by a further year if we waited. Secondly, that we know from further investigations of the roof that the clay tile is not the, not the issue. The issue is the design of the roof, um, the gullies aren't big enough, the falls aren't the right way, um, the, the fixing mechanism in 1908 was with wire. The wires have all corroded and gone. Um, and so what happens is um, you know, when tiles move, they all sort of sag together and they drag them all down. The design of the tiles changed now, so there's a, a more of a, a sharper angle on the groove that sits on the purlin. So that will stop them dripping down, but we'll be using um, either stainless steel or aluminium screws to fix those in, plus um, stainless steel clips to hold them together. Um, with the, the lightweight tile, we have 20 years of warranty, and we don't know what that tile's going to look like in terms of um, HUV in that time period. Um, and it's $25 a tile as opposed to $4 a tile. We know these tiles um, will last 60 years because they've been up there long now, some of them. So it was a bit of a, uh, it was a bit of a balance act, but at the end of the day, it's really a no-brainer to stick with what's there. And Heritage New Zealand loves for it. Any other? Your, uh, the standards that you are achieving are current standards, not longevity standards. Correct. Yeah. So we're aiming for um, the new building standard that currently exists at the moment. As I said before, our goal is to achieve at least 80% of that current 19%, because the north wing is separate at the moment, um, and that will sit somewhere in the 90s. And um, the strong bank, how many can you put, do you know how many you can do with one hip? Obviously, 
Um, that's a technical question for me, Willie. And yes. I'm not sure how many we can do at once. I suspect not too many, because if we're cutting grooves into those, um, those pumice concrete walls, we wouldn't want to cut too many at once, I wouldn't have thought. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure how many we can do at once. Um, um, it's, well, I think we're, some of it's going to be learning along the way after the first couple, um, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll wait to see what the experts say when we get our contractors on board. I should make this as a program of like grand designs. Grand design? Illustration nightmares. Yeah, illustration nightmares would probably be more appropriate. Um, I'll look, no, look, um, look um, we, we have a, a, a really good team of experts here. They're very passionate about this um, project, as I am, as the community is. And you know, they really want to make sure that we do this um, well. The council has instructed us to do this once and do it right. And, and that's what we intend to do. I missed it, but you said a bit earlier on in the presentation you're still fundraising six million dollars or something. Yes, that. Can you explain what that six million is for? Sure. So the six million that we need to raise further is for the exhibition redevelopment. As I said before, we've had to take everything out. All those will will need to start again from scratch. Whilst we've done a lot of research on the existing um, exhibition. Um, we want to bring something back new, exciting, and different for the community to look at. Um, and that, um, that is expensive. Um, it, for the 2011 exhibition development, I think it was around four million, and that took pretty much four years in time in terms of the time that you need to engage with EUE, um, loan agreements, um, a, lot, a lot of research. So we don't have that time, so we're gonna do this in half the time, um, and obviously it's more expensive because everything is more expensive than it was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. 51 million was the final cost? Um, 51 um, million um, is the final cost, yes, yeah. um, at, at this point. Um, once we complete develop design, we will um, we'll go back to the QS to be um, recosted again. We've got contingency in there. I think it's between that five and seven million at the moment. It's moving around as we finalise um, the um, building. I'd like to start that project with as much contingency as I can. You know, you've only got to look around the rest of New Zealand. Um, some of these projects have started off and escalated. Um, and, and that's why we've taken so long, is we're doing our homework up front, where a lot of these other projects have started before they've known all the, the unknowns, and they've discovered those along the way. And it's much easier to absorb cost at this point of the project than start absorbing it when you've got contractors on site and you're writing variations agreements. Of hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. That's great because this will close, as Trish just brought up, it's, this is the first real update yeah. that's been, and this will close down a lot of rumours of what it's going to cost. You know, it was in the, all over some sites so up to 90 million bucks. And yeah. That's why most of the population of Rotor Rural was quite frightened about it, but like, this is perfect. Yeah, look, um, um, some of these projects can, can be that. You know, have to look at the St. James and Wellington and how that's escalated. Any more questions? No? Okay, well look, thank you very much for coming along. Um, I'm really glad that we've had this opportunity to update um, you and to those viewers um, watching me live streaming at home. I haven't done that before, so it's great. Um, and, um, and, and look, we'll be, as I said, we'll be doing more of these talks and other talks on the other um, projects the council's current, currently um, working on. And uh, look, pop along, you'll learn a lot. Um, I'm sure you've learned something from me today. Oh, and by the way, because we do want to know what you think about these things, we've got a little, um, what do you call it? Happy show? or not. A what? Happy or not. Oh, yeah, happy or not. So if you, could, if you go and give time, if you could press. Happy. Yeah, happy for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so thank you very much, and um, we'll hope that we'll see you all again next Saturday. Okay. Mission to action. 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 Mission to